The put it down at a 24. This will be a 34-yard attempt. He missed one in the first half from 43 yards out. He's almost right in the center of the field. Cooper gets his kick away. I don't know. It's so good. It's wide to the left. Now listen to this crowd. Thousand crowd blowing their approval here tonight. Ah, huh? you might find some people who want to write this team off and kiss this team goodbye, but you won't find it at Memorial Stadium here tonight. They're standing and cheering right now. It's a hornet dig in and do it again. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Hiya, hiya. How's it going? My name's Tim, Tim Hanlon, your host for this uh, episode of our curious little podcast journey into what used to be in professional sports. We call it Good Seats Still Available. Thanks for coming by. Thanks again for uh, finding us, uh, telling your friends about us. We uh, we love uh, hearing from our listeners and uh, we appreciate uh, you giving us a spin for yet another week of fun-filled excitement in our little journeys together. This week, it's uh, back to football. I know there are a ton of you out there uh, who enjoy and regale in the uh, the past uh, histories of uh, the professional football game. And, and there's no uh, better person to uh, have a conversation with about the history of professional football in this country than our guest this week. His name is Upton Bell and a, a very uh, intriguing uh, person in the history of, of the sport. He was uh, literally... Uh, like his uh, book that we're going to be talking about, his autobiography, present at the creation. Yes, he was present at the creation of the NFL, uh, and uh, we'll talk about that, uh, as he was uh, the son of the second uh, commissioner of the National Football League. His name was Burt Bell. Uh, He was the commissioner from 1946 until 1959. And as you've heard in a number of previous episodes here on this little podcast, uh, you know the uh, the crazy and uh, tumultuous and uh, not guaranteed success uh, and choppiness, I guess, of the uh, of the National Football League. Lots of ragtag uh, stories and uh, uh, and and you know challenges to uh, a rough and tumble sport that uh, was not sort of a straight line. Let's put it that way. Uh, and uh, Burt Bell was uh, you know really the commissioner that uh, solidified and gelled uh, what was uh, a, a quite a, an array of uh, professional football doings in this country. Uh, not all of them uh, well-financed, not all of them um, uh, well-run, uh, and uh, a whole lot of stuff. And and somebody who was there, really, literally growing up in the midst of all of that, was Upton Bell. Uh, he, the, uh, the son uh, of Burt Bell and uh, his mother, a uh, famous... Uh, uh, Broadway actress by the name of Frances Upton, um, and, and what a unique life uh, as a kid, uh, but uh, tragically uh, lost his dad, uh, if you can believe it, uh, during the playing of an NFL football game, uh, literally in the stands. And, um, you know, uh, not only tragedy, but uh, something that I guess just transcends uh, that tragic event, uh, it, it kind of almost sealed in many respects uh, Upton's uh I guess almost destiny to sort of be uh, a football guy, right? Having grown up and, and literally been around the players of the uh, of the old NFL, as his dad sort of you know put all this stuff together and sort of laid the foundation for uh, for later years with uh, Pete Rozelle and and, and others uh, afterwards. And we know what the monstrosity that is the NFL today, uh, and it's uh, almost unrecognizable based on uh, what you compare it to from what uh, Burt Bell sort of inherited and. And and brought along over the uh, over the late '40s and uh, the bulk of the 1950s. But Upton Bell, as a kid, certainly uh, absorbed all of that, and uh, you know, certainly uh, uh, found his way uh, as he became an adult uh, into the football world. Uh, and there are a couple of different stops in our conversation that you will hear that are especially fascinating to our little genre here of forgotten teams and leagues. And the first place that he uh, had his real first professional job was the Baltimore Colts. A team of, uh, you know, a, a amazing success in the '60s, uh, uh, which led to the New England Patriots, the uh, former or just former Boston Patriots, as they were coming out of the AFL uh, into the uh, into the NFL, 
and uh, and Upton Bell was uh, in the in the throes of uh, of management of that team, and arguably set uh, the tone for uh, taking the team, which would uh, had its sort of ups and downs, and and solidifying it to uh, arguably some of the seeds of what it's uh, become today, uh, is almost a, if you can call it that a dynasty. Um, but interestingly as well, we talk about the Colts, of course, uh, the Patriots, not so much because, you know, they're still around. So that's that's a, a genre for other podcasts to explore. But uh, when uh, Upton left uh, the New England Patriots, uh, he knew that he needed to stay in football. And perhaps it wasn't going to be in the NFL uh, immediately after his departure from the Patriots. But what was happening around that time? And uh, uh, students of our podcast will certainly know that circa 1974, 1975, there was this thing called the, wait for it, World Football League. And Upton Bell was a, a very uh, uh, important part of the history of that crazy and wacky league. Uh, and uh, if you remember any uh, semblance of the New York Stars at the old Downing Stadium on Randall's Island in New York, uh, if you remember uh, the one game that the Stars played when they were announced to move to Charlotte in the middle of the season in 1974, that one game being played in Chicago, where they were officially known as the Charlotte Stars. Uh, or if you remember them in Charlotte for the rest of the 1974 season of the WFL, or the bulk of the, or the all of the, say all because it wasn't really a full season in 1975 of the World Football League, the Charlotte Hornets, Upton Bell was the guy behind that franchise. And it's very interesting stuff. Uh, you could make the argument, as uh, as Bell does in our chat, uh, and uh, it's very easy to see that the the market uh, of the, that is now known by the Carolina Panthers in the NFL, obviously for sale, uh, we think it's past a $2.5 billion mark. We'll see where it goes for. Upton Bell largely was responsible for shall we say, tilling the soil of that market, the Charlotte, North Carolina market, uh, in the earliest days in the 70s for its uh, readiness for pro football. He knew that there was an appetite for it, and that was, uh, frankly, his condition, if he was ever going to get into the WFL, is to uh, to either uh, launch a franchise or relocate one to that market. And years later, he's been proven more than right, as we see uh, just an astronomical amount uh, going now for the bidding for the Carolina Panthers franchise. So much stuff to get to uh, with our very uh, fun and interesting conversation uh, with Upton Bell. He, the author of Present at the Creation, My Life in the NFL and the Rise of America's Game, uh, coming up in a couple of seconds. So an interesting promotion. So uh, aside from going to uh, our friends at sportshistorycollectibles.com, where you can use the promo code GOODSEATS to get 15% off your purchases, that's where you're going to find all kinds of fun and interesting memorabilia for teams and leagues that are not around anymore or, or teams that have just moved to to new locations and have different uh, uh, personas now. Go to sportshistorycollectibles.com and use that promo code Good Seats and make sure that you get 15% off your purchases when you go there. Of course, our other uh, our sponsor, our longtime sponsor, is our friends at Audible. And uh, audibletrial.com slash good seats is the place to get your free one month uh, subscription to the Audible service and a free audiobook download for you to enjoy. And uh, this, I think, is our first guest, our first author, uh, whose book is indeed an audio, audible book for audible, auto, audio book form. Yes, on Audible. There you go. You say it three times fast. It's not easy. Uh, Upton Bell's uh, Present at the Creation is indeed an audiobook. That could be the first uh, free book that you download using uh, your free trial at Audible, audibletrial.com slash good seats. Get your free one month subscription and why not use your free audiobook download credit for Upton Bell's book, Present at the Creation. And uh, we're also going to have a very interesting promotional thing uh, at the end of the show. So if you listen to the end of the show, uh, you're going to have a chance to uh, win a free copy uh, of Upton Bell's book. Uh, it is a tremendous read. If you if you call yourself a football fan and a student of the history of uh, the sport of football professionally in this in this country, you will thoroughly enjoy this book uh, by Upton Bell. And uh, listen, at the end of the show, the end of our interview, I will let you know how you too can uh, win a uh, free copy uh, of Upton Bell's book, Present at the Creation. All right. So let us tease you 
uh, into listening to the rest of the episode and uh, and figure out a way to get a free copy by listening to our very fun interview with Upton Bell here on the show. I had a chance to to read a, a good portion of your book, especially of course uh, the uh, chapters devoted to the uh, the WFL uh, escapades and. I'm not sure if you've uh, got a chance to listen to any of our shows, but this week we've got uh, our first of two episodes with uh, one of the uh, sort of researchers uh, of the WFL, a guy named Mark Speck. And um, it's uh, we've been doing this show for about, I don't know, about a, almost a year now. And mm-hmm. um, the fascination of teams and leagues and those kinds of things that uh, have somehow uh, come and gone for whatever reasons is, is an endless curiosity. And pro football, clearly uh, no shortage of such. Um, and uh, I suspect uh, some of your uh, personal stories and recollections are going to be uh, very, uh, uh, it, very interesting to to our audience who has glommed onto this uh, this odd and uh, an intriguing topic uh, as I have. Well, uh, you know, one thing, mm-hmm. one thing I'll tell you before we start. Sure. Is is uh, and I've reminded people of this. Uh, and one of the reasons I went to the World Football League, there were many, uh, but. A lot of people don't remember the NFL, but they almost went under too. the 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 early NFL was really the WFL, the AFL, every other thing. They lost twenty two teams in the first twenty or so years, and Burt Bell's team and and very few of them uh, were going to survive if he didn't come up with the draft. You would be talking about history today, and there would be some other league that was started by somebody else. Maybe the All-America Conference, which was a big thing in Chicago, Arch Ward, who nobody trusted in the NFL, was the one behind that. But the NFL, if again, if Burt Bell doesn't come along, my father, no league. No league, period. Well, let's use that as a segue, because we have, uh, we've we've talked about some of those early uh, early years. We've had a, a yep. couple of episodes, right? We've had... Uh, our friend Ken Crippen on episode 18 talking about the All-American Football Conference. Uh, we've talked about the Cleveland Rams uh, with our friend Jim Selecki in, in episode number 12. And, yep. uh, and we also uh, uh, did go uh, very deep. One of our earliest episodes was about the Steagles, um, yep. which you know, obviously <laughs> your, your dad is probably part of. But So let's, let's, let's maybe start there because there's probably nobody in, uh, in the business of professional football that, uh, that had a more – um, I don't know, predestined uh, DNA, shall we say, than you did, right? Uh, given well, uh, your father's uh, uh, experiences uh, with the NFL and uh, and you growing up in and around that, no? Right. Well, I, I think I'm probably the only person alive uh, now with Dan Rooney gone. Uh, Bart Rooney Jr. is a little bit older than me uh, that, that really knows the whole story from, from a, a club owners to a commissioner's to club owners, to a team. I, I know the, the only thing I was missing was was being born early enough to be in the Canton showroom with Jim Thorpe. But but back to 1937, I can tell you everything. Well, so let, let maybe some of those earliest childhood memories, I guess, because uh, you're, you're, you're growing up as the, as the son of uh, the then NFL commissioner, right? And and you're, 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 you're mentioning, right, not necessarily the... Uh, uh, the strong and solid and 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 future is bright, uh, NFL. But but are arguably uh, a league that uh, clearly uh, in the shadow of of Major League Baseball, right? The national pastime, and not necessarily a future that was uh, guaranteed by any means. Especially when you look at going through the war and stuff. So maybe some of your maybe some of your earliest memories as as the son of. Uh, the leader of the National Football League and all its well, well why, why don't uh, I don't mean to interrupt, but why don't we just take it a little bit before that? Sure. Because I was the son of the owner of the Eagles, who paid uh, one player five dollars a week extra to babysit me. Well, okay, let's hear about that. How, how does that happen? So you you tell me when you want to start. Are we recording or not recording? Oh, we're, we're we're going. Let's go. Let's go. Oh, we're going. I'm I'm sorry. Okay, so. Uh, what what I'd like to do is take you back uh, to, to really uh, when, when I was born in 1937. I lived the first four or five years in a hotel that my father's father owned, the Ritz Carlton, in Philadelphia, and then lived in various homes 
around the area with 33 football players. And, of course, as a young child, you think it's pretty damn exciting to go from place to place, uh, not realizing that the reason that, that, that he moved from place to place is what he could afford. And at that time, it, it was interesting because he and Art Rooney both founded their franchises at the same time. Uh, with the idea that they would try to survive together. R- Rooney, you know, naming his team, originally it was not the Steelers, uh, but he renamed the Steelers, and then Burt Bell came in and bought the Frankfurt Yellow Jackets with my mother's money and and uh, uh, walked by a sign, saw the National Recovery Act, and said that's the Eagles, and they were on their way. And, and actually, uh, a friend of mine called me about 10 or 15 years ago, and he said, do you know that I think we've traced it. Uh, he was doing a story or a book on Art Rooney's life. He said that Art Rooney would send my father hundred, two hundred, five hundred, a thousand dollars in in dollar bills in an envelope to keep his franchise and payroll going. I mean that that was what it was really like. I mean they they not only merged the the Steagles, uh, but but basically it was it was hand to mouth, and this is. Bert Bell was son of one of the richest men in Philadelphia, who was uh, also the attorney general of Pennsylvania and uh, owned hotels all over the place. Yet his father, who was very, very big, uh, that actually one of the founders of the Walter Camp Rules Committee, John C. Bell, you know, said to my father, you know, I've lent you hundreds of thousands of dollars in the stock market. He said, but I am not going to get involved in pro football college game is the game and that's how my father ended up on his own but though those early years were you know were just really amazing times and and you know as somebody that was a child growing up you, you know you grow up around football players you're living with them and and you grow up pretty quickly you're you're a child but you're really not a child so that's why my memory so damn good is that that uh, in in those times there there were not the distraction of television or or uh, any of the cell phones or anything else like that. You paid attention to what people had to say, and and I would I will say that the players of of that time, and then going all the way through after the Second World War, they were men when they were sixteen, seventeen years old. They went through the depression. They knew what it was like to play for nothing. Uh, they weren't as big, quick, or fast as the people today. But I will tell you this. I learned more from them about life, how to deal with it, how to keep your mouth shut, how, how to uh, go on through life, how to play through injuries. But in, in many cases, they were so mature, it was just really amazing. It, it, you know, it, it's a lost generation. It 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 was football's Paris of the 1920s, and uh, the only one around uh, was maybe a Red Smith. There was no Ernest Hemingway, but if it was, they would have romanticized one of the great stories of the game. No, I I suspect that we'll we'll do even more episodes on on specific teams and and various yep. challengers, and we've we've talked about even the Memphis Tigers, which never actually made the NFL, but uh, could have been, and arguably uh, on a good day, beat a few NFL teams back in the in that era. Well, what do you think it was? And obviously this is, you know, obviously through the, the prism of, of early childhood, which, you know, may not be crystal clear, but, but as you, as you got older and, and sort of maybe looked back on it, what, what do you think it was about this, I guess, fledgling professional version of, of football uh, that was such a, 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 a glint in your dad's eye and, and all the players and, and people that you encountered in your youth? Well, what was it about the sport at that time, especially given it wasn't, Arguably, it, a it, thing it, at that point. It's the same thing for me today as it was then, and it's the lost art. And what it was, I'd use one word: love. It was, it was a great love of something, and it wasn't money, because very few, if any, had money. That included players, owners, coaches. There was a love for the game itself, and what it meant. And if there wasn't that love, like the love you find in a marriage or with a friend or something like that, 
it never would have lasted because there was no reason. And I understood this as a child. There was no reason on the face of the earth for people uh, to do what they did then. They weren't going to make any money. My father never made a cent with the with the Eagles, which he then sold and became full time partners with Art Rooney. He never made any money with the Steelers. Uh, he made decent money as commissioner, uh, but but that wasn't it. It and I I do understand that a book is coming out next year, uh, written by a uh, a very famous writer in Baltimore that looks at the six original owners of the NFL: Burt Bell, the Maras. Uh, uh, George Preston Marshall, uh, 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 Curly Lambeau, Art Rooney, uh, the, those people. And, and it, again, he, he had said to me, and the book isn't out yet, he said, when you look at them and you look what they did and you look at the owners today, you know, billionaires, he said, uh, he, he said you're going to realize uh, how much the world has missed with, with men like that. Now, they weren't saints, and they and they certainly uh, weren't weren't people that uh, you know at all times were loving, but they loved something because there was no reason, none to go on. Yeah, and, and especially you look at something like World War II, clearly, too. That also was a could have easily been a dagger, uh, not only short term, but maybe for the whole kit and caboodle, right? And, and well, okay, yeah, and again. Uh, it was Bert Bell who stood up in the league meetings. Remember, he had the least amount of money of anybody. And he said, gentlemen, this is before he became commissioner. He said, if we close down, we will never reopen. Because a lot of, a lot of them, uh, you know, other leagues were closing down for the Second World War. And, and he saw the problems. And he said, we, we will, if we close down, this was at the league meeting, he had to convince them. We will never reopen again. Again, Burt Bell steps into the breach as an owner. Uh, and that's, he stepped in the breach with, with, the, with the pro football draft that saved every sport. Stepped in the breach again because if they had closed and the All-America Conference was coming one way or another, it would have been the old All-America Conference and Paul Brown would have been commissioner. Or Arch Ward uh, from the Chicago Tribune. It wouldn't have been Burt Bell and, and uh, those teams, including the Giants, that did have some money, the Maris, they, they, they never would have opened again. And that's, again, the luck of, luck of life. But he had to convince them that this would be the doom. This would seal the doom of the league. And after all the things they survived, if they closed it down, it would never reopen again. No, it's, it's it's very interesting and obviously lost on on clearly a generation or two, frankly, of football fans, and and this is partially why we sort of get back into into these conversations. Why what what starts out sort of as a an exploration of of what we say used to be in pro sports, right? Sometimes that seems to be just curious or or even frivolous or or hard to believe stories, but the reality is that you know encompassed in all of those things are are the foundational elements of. Uh, what modern day fans and 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 sport basically uh, sort of enjoy today. Um, I, I don't want to get too much into uh, your dad's background because this is really a story about you. But before yep. we sort of move on to you and your uh, and your your professional football career as you advance in in uh, uh, in age for, into your teens and into your uh, into your early twenties, um, I, I think it's helpful for the audience to sort of understand, especially those who don't know any better. These crazy kids today. Uh, some of the contributions that your dad did make uh, as commissioner of the NFL, because some of those, frankly, are uh, substantial, long-lasting, and elements of what exists today. Um, maybe well, you want to recall some of those. Here, here's the amazing thing. And in fact, the NFL Network uh, did, uh, on the anniversary of the draft last year, a, a piece with myself and Ernie Acorsi, who was a former general manager of the New York Giants, Everything that Burt Bell instituted, that's now, let me see, almost 70 years ago, is still around today. The NFL draft, the first television policy, uh, the waiver wire, uh, the, the, the thing that, that Bill Belichick here and other coaches try to avoid every week, which is the injury report. Sure. The, the, 
And the reason he did that is in 1946, so right after he became commissioner, on Christmas, I think it was Christmas Day, he was called by Frank Hogan, the district attorney in New York, and said, I think that we have a betting scandal. You better get on a train and get to New York. It was the night before uh, the championship game between the Giants and the New York Giants and the Chicago Bears. And they found out that two players had talked to gamblers. Uh, one, my father suspended uh, immediately, uh, uh, Merrill Hapes, and the other one he let play in the game, Frank Filchuk. He then suspended him for life. What he did after that uh, is still around today. He called a friend of his. His former quarterback of the Eagles was a quarterback by the name of Davey O'Brien, who went on after pro football to become uh, one of the top people in the FBI and probably the best pistol shot in America. He called uh, Davey O'Brien. He said, talk to J. Edgar Hoover. And he said, what I'm looking for, ex-FBI agents who've either retired or out of the FBI, that I can put in every city around the NFL, 12 teams in, and uh, to check on, on gambling, to check on players that go into places where gamblers are, and, and I want a report every week. We will put them on part-time. And uh, then, then, he, then he moved to say that every team must report by no later than Thursday uh, what, what, what the injury report is, who is injured, who isn't, and the reasons why. And then what he did on top of it is that he would watch the point spread. And he knew four or five gamblers. There was a, a, there was a phone at our house. It was a red phone that would ring uh, every Thursday through Sunday from people like, and I mention it in my epilogue, Frisco Legs and, and, and uh, anonymous gamblers that would not give their full name and would call in right up to game time and give him the reports on what the point spread was. And if he saw it, it fluctuating and, and moving too much, he would immediately call the team and say, I want to know, is somebody hurt that you haven't reported? If, if they have, they can't play. So he instituted that. He instituted also the thing that Roger Goodell uh, hides behind today. He had my, my uncle, his brother, was the uh, governor of Pennsylvania and later the chief justice of the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. He had him write into the rule, record and rules manual in the NFL bylaws that uh, the commissioner in the best interest of pro football would have the right to rule on any disputes between owners and players and owners and owners. And that's still there, 60 or 70 years. Uh, and that was the Burt Bell rule. And he used that to protect himself not only from owners that he thought were getting out of hand, but also players. So there is a whole litany of, of rules that he put in that still remain in the rule book today. But the two major things... Uh, and I know that Pete Rozelle uh, got credit for one of them, but it was really Burt Bell. Uh, the television policy and and also the pro football draft. Yeah, also uh, things like uh, uh, sort of uh, acknowledging and uh, uh, the union and the Pro Bowl and some of those things, too. Right. So, so there's, a, there's a whole bunch yeah. of things that that arguably, to your point, you know, Rozelle certainly uh, clearly given the sort of modernization m mantle. Right. But uh, I think a lot of it, much of it. Uh, substantially goes back to to Bert uh, Bell, your dad, in 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 the the earliest of days of of this league. Every player today should get down on bended knee and thank Bert Bell because he was the one uh, that went to the owners and said, "If you don't recognize the players' association, you'll have to fire me." You think you think Goodell or you think anybody today would do that? Not. He was willing to put his job on the line, he said, because the players deserve a union and the players deserve the treatment. As a result, uh, when he died, the owners then uh, named the, uh, the, the pension that every player gets today is the Burt Bell pension. Now, they added Pete Rozelle's name. Why? I have no idea. But it, it was and has always been the Burt Bell pension plan. If, and the other thing that he did is he went to uh, a fellow in Baltimore by the name of Sig Hyman, a pension planners, and with Carol Rosenblum, who was his friend, the owner, uh, he was the one that set in motion the monies that would go into, even in those days, in the 50s, 
so players would have something uh, if they were injured or when their career was over. He loved the player, he loved the owner, and he was afraid of neither. Very interesting. So with that kind of background, that kind of legacy, uh, I think, frankly, just by osmosis, if not DNA, uh, I, I said it earlier, do, do you feel you were preordained to have a, a career and a life in football? Uh, and did your dad even, you know, as you were thinking about that, perhaps in your teenage years, et cetera, um, did he ever try to dissuade you from that or encourage you from that? Or, or what, how was your sort of life sort of uh, evolving with relation to football that you can remember as you sort of got your well, seat, my, uh, so to speak, as well, an adult? My life was pretty damn good until, as you see in the first chapter of the book, and I hope people will get this book because it's, it, it's, uh, it really tells the whole story uh, up till today. My life was doing pretty well. I was a pretty good basketball player. In fact, I broke Tom Gola's record as a freshman at LaSalle College. Life was good. Uh, I, I knew that someday I'd probably be in pro football, but that wasn't on my mind. I was a kid. And, and uh, you know, I thought, well, whatever happens, uh, eventually I'm going to be in the game. But I, I was thinking about college and I'm playing basketball. And then October the 11th came by and my junior year at LaSalle College. I'm at a football game on a, on a warm Sunday watching the Eagles and Steelers, the two teams that Burt Bell owned. Uh, my father's across the field, and he drops dead. At the football game in the last two minutes, as the Eagles score the winning touchdown, uh, people say to this day, Red Smith, the great writer for the Times, Pulitzer Prize winner, said it was one of the greatest ways for anybody to go out. And I ran into Red years later and said, maybe for you, but not for me. Because on that day, everything changed. Uh, my life changed. I had to think about now what's going to happen. As you know in life, uh, when somebody passes like that, the people who were your friends uh, might not be your friends anymore. And there might not be people who are willing to do things for you, give you a job in the NFL. You know, they... they maybe an Art Rooney, somebody like that, maybe a George Hallis, but you never know. The thing that I also learned that week was one of the great ironies of life is that Burt Bell had made a deal, never told his family about it. He was going to retire at the end of the year as commissioner of the NFL. He'd made a deal with the bank in Philadelphia to buy, uh, repurchase the team that he owned years ago, the Philadelphia Eagles for $940,000. And if he had lived just to Wednesday, uh, I would be talking to you as the owner of the Eagles, not as the owner of just Upton Bell. <laughs> so all of those things uh, kind of uh, made life speed up. I had to make choices. I had to do things very, very quickly. And so going from a kid that you know, loved life, loved football, playing basketball at LaSalle College. Not a worry in the world. I went to somebody who was now 21 years old and had to figure a way to get into pro football before it was too late. And that's when Carol Rosenblum, who my father, got into pro football with the Colts. I called him, met at his house in 1960 while we were watching uh, the uh, speech of JFK. And uh, Rosenblum was a big backer of the Kennedys, a, a, actually a partner of Joe Kennedy. And, and uh, to you know, bring things quickly up to date, we made a deal. He sent me to training camp that summer in 1960. The, the Colts had won two championships in a row, one of the great teams of that time, with Johnny Aninas and Raymond Berry and Lenny Moore and Jim Parker, some of the, some of the greatest players all in the Hall of Fame. Sure. And that was my start. Summer at training camp, I come back, finish uh, the final year at LaSalle, and then go back for good in 1961. And the rest of my life went pretty damn quickly. So when you're, you're, you're in the Colts organization, what, uh, what, what's, your, you know, what's your role? Is it defined? Is it, hey, kid, come in, and, and let's, we'll try to find something for you? Um, how wide-eyed were you? And... What were you expecting and what were they expecting? Or may maybe neither you, neither of you did expect anything at this point. Well, they, they did the right thing. They started me at the bottom. I started in the ticket office. 
and work my way up uh, from the uh, ticket office uh, to the front office as the assistant personnel director. And then finally as the personnel director in charge of all scouting and signing of the players' contracts at that time. I had a pretty quick rise. I went there in 61, and by 64, I was in the scouting department. And by 67, I was the director of player personnel at the age of 27. So uh, things went pretty quickly. And I think the reason was is that the, I had had that background for so long that when I got into the area that I really loved, uh, that I knew I was around players all my life. I knew who was quickly. I knew who was quick and who wasn't. I knew uh, how a, a person should catch a football. I knew how somebody should run. I, I knew all of those things. So with that background, I was able to go in and quickly assimilate uh, what a scout needed to know. So that that part of my background really helped me. If, if I hadn't grown up around football players and kind of studied them as a kid, uh, probably that wouldn't have happened. Yeah, that's interesting, right? Because, you know, I, the, I there's sort of a thing out there, right? If you, if you kind of know at an early age kind of what you are good at and or what you want to do, um, it almost seems like in many cases, not always, it's life does throw curveballs, et cetera. But, you know, you kind of almost orient some of your your learnings and your thinking around some of those things. And it just becomes a natural sort of segue. And it clearly, you know, you had a, a whole bunch of that. Uh, either unbeknownst to you or or now more pronounced, you could it was almost like a reservoir of 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 knowledge, right? That you could literally uh, uh, dip into, right? And 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 obviously by by your your twenties, right? You're 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 literally moving up the uh, up the food chain very quickly, and I think that's that's a testament to uh, well your you're, childhood you're, background. Well, you know something, and and this is interesting that uh, the first time uh, I went to a training camp other than, you know, the Eagles when I was a kid, was the Chicago Bears and George Hallis. And the first the summer, 1946, at the Bears training camp, and Clark Shaughnessy, who really changed pro football, uh, took the running back and moved him out to a wide receiver, they didn't call it then, and really opened up the passing game for Sid Luckman and, and those great Chicago Bear teams. Uh, and their training camp was in Rensselaer, Indiana. And I, I remember... Uh, Hallis, uh, who treated us not as a bunch of kids. Now, remember, I'm just nine years old, and my brother is 11. And he would let us come in to the meetings at night and watch the coaches uh, discuss the day's practice. And this is with Patty Driscoll and Luke Johnson. You know, two of them in the uh, – well, uh, Patty Driscoll is in the Hall of Fame – and watch Clark Shaughnessy. I can't say at the age of nine that I was sitting there saying – Mmm, that's going to be the future of pro football. <laughs> well, I saw him draw up in the blackboard and explain to Hallis how, you know, the, you, in those days you had the full backfield. You had two, you had the halfback, the fullback, and then another halfback. He was diagramming how to move a halfback out to what today we call the wide receiver, the flanker. And uh, to see those things, and then watch him practice as a nine-year-old. I never, I, I never forget that because of two things. One, Hallis uh, didn't treat us like a bunch of kids. You know, get the hell out of here. He let us sit in and watch it. And you're never going to get that today. You're not going to let anybody do that. And that's why I always have a great feeling for the Hallis family and the Chicago Bears. I wish they were as good today as they were then. Oh, well, there are a lot but of they're people, pretty damn bad. Well, there are a lot of people in Chicago that would agree with that sentiment. There's no doubt about that. Um, and I'm not from here. I, you know, I, I married into a Chicago family, and uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's pronounced. And uh, there's a whole bunch of reasons I think as to why maybe that team has not uh, uh, gotten to that next sort of uh, level, promised land, uh, save for a season or two. Um, all right. Well, so so in the Colts, right? So I, I'm really curious. Um, Give me some sense of what it was like um, uh, being so involved with the Colts and a very successful franchise at that. Uh, but in particular, vis-a-vis -vis the AFL, right? Because, you know, across the aisle there, you had this fledgling league that was uh, certainly more colorful, certainly taking chances, being a bit more daring, some more. How are you as a uh, as a, an increasingly senior member of of one of the more sort of vaunted franchises in the NFL. What what was your take and the and the team's take on this upstart that was um 
you know, was it on your radar how much of it was? And and arguably interesting to know because you ultimately went to one of the franchises that were part of that uh, later, uh, uh, you know, in the decade. Unfortunately. Well, let me just start with saying this goes back to Burt Bell again because Lamar Hunt uh, came to my father in 1959 and said, uh, uh, I'd like to buy at that time, there were two franchises. There, there was the Chicago Cardinals and the Chicago Bears. And the Cardinals eventually moved to St. Louis. A lot of people don't maybe remember, but the Chicago Cardinals uh, in 1946, 47, and 48 were one of the best teams in football with some of the greatest players, better than the Bears. And uh, so uh, Hunt wanted to buy the Cardinals. And my father said to him, you know, wait. He said, uh, we, we've got to get, we still have some teams in the red, including the Cardinals. Let's wait till we get in the, the, the black and then uh, let's talk. And then Hunt said, well, what, what about an expansion franchise? And he said, again, wait, wait for a while. And he said, oh, you know, I promise you we'll, we'll, we'll take you in. Well, Hunt, of course, my father dropped dead about six months later. But Hunt had come to him through Davey O'Brien, again, back to the quarterback who played for him that I mentioned and the FBI people. Davey O'Brien was a friend of Lamar Hunt, so Lamar Hunt sent Davey O'Brien to see my father. Uh, and, and what Hunt wanted to do, Hunt said, you know, I, I think I'm going to found a new league. He didn't say it that way. Hunt was a very shy person. And Hunt uh, said, if, if I found a new league, would you, Bert Bell, be willing to be commissioner of both? And my father said, no, I, 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 I can't do that. I uh, thank you anyway, but it, it would, I mean, Hunt was really serious. He wanted Bert Bell to be the commissioner of both leagues, and they'd be, you know, they'd play a championship game. Give me permission. I'm going to Congress this week because my father testified all the time before Congress on antitrust. And he said, if you'll let me do it, I will announce that there is a new league coming and we welcome the competition. And Hunt said, fine. And that's what happened. And then, of course, ABC takes over the AFL. Uh, they begin to blossom, at least to compete. And then the, the, I have a chapter in there about the war between the two leagues. And I, I felt like uh, that, that they would have a chance to succeed where other leagues didn't. Uh, because they had people at Baron Hilton and they had uh, p- some people uh, besides Hunt that really had money, Bud Adams and some other people. Uh, the other thing is that they had a television contract, which most other leagues didn't have. And, of course, the thing that, that I knew eventually would happen is that the NFL owners would get tired of uh, driving up the costs on players that were doubling and tripling and just say, you know what, we got to figure out a way to have a merger. But in the meantime, you have people like Pete Rozelle, who was a general manager of, of the Los Angeles Rams and other NFL people that were, were, were paying, you know, double, triple the amount of players. And there were their work, uh, you know, everything from kidnappings to you name it, of <laughs> players with the two legs fighting for them. I once was what they call an NFL babysitter that went to Atlanta to try and protect four players from Georgia and Georgia tech. One that we eventually drafted from the other league. And they, they were in a hotel down the street and they, every time the players would visit us and they go across the street and visit the other people. And you had everything going hunt sending Otis Taylor, who was a great player with the Kansas city chiefs. Uh, that made uh, the catch down the sidelines that defeated Minnesota in that Super Bowl in 1970. You, you actually, I'm sorry, 71, but you actually had a situation where Hunt sent a plane and, and had two people take Otis Taylor out of a hotel room outside of Dallas and sneak him away from the NFL in one of his jets and then sign him. I mean, you can't believe what was going on between the two lakes. Today they probably arrest half the people. Yeah, we had uh, we had a very good conversation. Our th- our third ever episode with uh, Michael McCambridge, who uh, arguably wrote the uh, definitive uh, biography of of Hunt and, and his uh, sporting life, and uh, yep. it, 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 some some really uh, intriguing kind of stories. Uh, even even to the point too where I think Hunt would even uh, uh, do uh, some of those uh, kind of clandestine meetings for 
folks like crazy George Henderson, the uh, professional cheerleader who he wanted to get yep. for for his teams and stuff. So uh, we also had on our, our on our show early on. Um, but but it, so that's I think that's also very interesting, too, because to, for you to sort of see uh, the the eventuality, I guess, of the AFL and it's. I guess, as the years went on, sort of inevitable end point in some way, shape or form. Right. They did have leverage. Right. They had a television contract. They had money. They had owners who were willing to, you know, stick it out for a period of time and had the the wherewithal to do so. Um, and, you know, uh, I think it's really interesting, especially in contrast to, to what we'll talk about in a couple of seconds or in a minute or two, uh, is the WFL, which had little to none of those things, right? And they, you- they did, but, but I will tell you this. Here's the breaking point. Here's what really made the merger. When the AFL uh, uh, brought Al Davis in as acting commissioner, and Davis went out and signed every big name, secretly signed, John Brody, uh, all, all of the quarterbacks, he signed all the top quarterbacks, you know, not not the Uninuses or the Stars, but all the top quarterbacks of the NFL and all the top players. Signed them with secret contracts. And when, when the owners found out about it in the NFL, that was what made the merger. As much as I, I, I dislike Davis about certain things, he was really brilliant with that. He said, you know what? Uh, he convinced the NFL owners, he said, this is war. And he said, uh, you give me the power, and I'll go out, and I guarantee you, uh, because there are a lot of players underpaid in, in the NFL, and I guarantee you we'll be able to sign them. And he did. And the minute the NFL saw that and someone will awaken, I, I think Billy Wade, uh, who was with Hallis at that time, I think they signed Billy Wade, they signed everybody. And, in fact, a, a little un, uh, unknown secret is that Davis was really PO'd uh, because he didn't want the merger. He said, we can beat these people. And he wanted to continue on as commissioner. And they finally went to him and said, Al, look, Tex Ram and Lamar and uh, Lamar Hunt and some other people uh, put together this, this merger. Uh, I'm sorry, you're out. Davis was really pissed off because he felt uh, that they, they got a new contract with NBC they dropped ABC, they got NBC, they got the money, and they went out. And, and, and by the way, I would have been in favor of, of, of having peace, but I would have been in favor of maintaining the two distinct leagues a meeting in a Super Bowl the way it originally was. I didn't like it at all. This MS, AFC and NFC is crap. That, that was really because there was two different styles of football. NFL much more conservative, AFL wide open, AFL more great African-American players, which, by the way, I detail in one of my, um, one of my chapters in my book about uh, being in the South during the 60s and the great uh, emergence of the great African-American players and the prejudice that you see in the South and, and the consideration of the NFL, whereas the AFL would go in and they sign many, if you look at their rosters, of, of the really great African-American players. That was the difference in the leagues. And I'll tell you something, to this day, I wish it had remained two separate leagues under one commissioner with a championship game. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, it's almost uh, 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 taking a page out of uh, Major League Baseball, right? Uh, you know, the American League and the, the National League having some uh, unique uh, sort of differences. Arguably, that's gotten less and less distinctive as the years have gone on and money has become more of an issue. Um, but, you know, that, 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 that would be a very interesting sort of different dynamic. But that said, um, you know, you were clearly quite uh, part of a very successful franchise with the Colts, right? Uh, whatever which way it was, right, as an NFL franchise. But then obviously as the, the beginnings of the merger started to happen and that Super Bowl or what became the Super Bowl, uh, sort of happened. I mean, uh, you were you were part of a of a very successful franchise uh, going into the uh, early 1970s. I guess you were a hot commodity, right? And uh, hence the the move to uh, what then became the New England Patriots uh, in 1971. No. Well, one one of first and foremost, uh, because the Colts, uh, we we agreed along with Cleveland and Pittsburgh to move over into what 
became the AFC because they needed uh, they needed not only quality but they needed a th- I think it was thirteen and thirteen twenty six at the time. Uh, but I would say, like all people, I committed the chief mistake of youth, which was you know I had everything going in Baltimore, and there were other teams that were interested in me as as a general manager, and I saw that I could move into the Patriots and completely rebuild them, which which I was able to bring in some of the top people in football. But the mistake was, uh, which nobody should make, is that uh, I got a verbal agreement that I would have the right to hire and fire the head coach. But I never got it in writing, and that ended up, and people warned me. A lawyer warned me and said, you know something? If you don't have it in writing, don't go. But when you're 32 years old, you think you can change the world. To a degree, you can, but not completely. And uh, that was my downfall, not getting that. And when I wanted to fire the coach, we had the team really going, good people coming in. The owner stepped in and said, you're not going to do it. And that from that on in, it was downhill. And eventually I got fired because I couldn't get along with with the owner. And I was only, when I was fired, I was only 35 years old, which most people are just starting off at that time. So enter the WFL. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a quick, quick point here. I mean, at the time, you're the youngest general manager in the NFL uh, and, uh, you know, qu- quite, quite something and quite substantial uh, in terms of, uh, of, of your presence. And I think it's also probably a lesson that, uh, that, you know, a lot of people sort of, I mean, at the end of the day, Owners own, right? And and the people who work for, you know, whether it's uh, and knowing uh, the best about uh, the sport or the business or whatever, right? Uh, you know, not not always. Owners know how to own. They don't necessarily know how to run. Uh, but obviously, you know, at the end of the day, the tie goes to uh, the person writing the checks. And well, and, yeah, you know, you, it's, you, look, issue, right? it's a it's a great line that I told Ernie Acorsi of the Giants is there are only two. Uh, two things in the NFL. You're either an owner or a renter, and you'll always be a renter, whether you're Bill Belichick, Tom Brady, Peyton Manning, anybody, Vince Lombardi, you name them. They were all renters, just like Upton Bell. And that was the key. If Burt Bell had uh, lived another couple of days, I would be an owner, and and I would be renting people. (laughs) All right, just when it was getting interesting, let's uh, let's bring this uh, to a grinding halt, shall we? Ah, just kidding. Uh, we got to pay the bills around here, and uh, our friends at Audible have been very helpful in attempting to allow us to pay some of those bills, and uh, we want to call them out now uh, and remind you that uh, a free audiobook download is yours for the taking, and also a free one-month uh, subscription to the service uh, of Audible at audibletrial.com slash goodseats. Again, audibletrial.com slash goodseats for your free one-month trial of the Audible service and, interestingly, most interestingly, a free audiobook download for you to enjoy. 180,000 titles and growing uh, every day to choose from, and there's uh, absolutely no excuse to not find at least one title amongst that uh, cavernous uh, selection uh, available to you that uh, you won't find to be enjoyable and uh, and good for the soul, including uh, a couple of books that might be interesting to our audience. And yes, some new ones, frankly. Uh, that I'm finally listening to. One that I'm listening to right now uh, is by Carson Cunningham. It's narrated by Paul Bamer, and it's called Underbelly Hoops, Adventures in the CBA, a.k.a. the Crazy Basketball Association, which is really, of course, about uh, the Continental Basketball Association, which for many years uh, was sort of this ragtag minor league uh, of the NBA. And that's uh, it's a book I'm about two chapters into right now, and uh, hopefully maybe a guest will get uh, for a future episode. Also, uh, in my queue, next up, Uh, is another guest that I'd like to get. Uh, And her book that she wrote is also uh, narrated by her. Her name is Jeannie Buss. And of course, Jeannie is the uh, daughter of Jerry Buss, of course, the uh, uh, wildly successful founder of the Los Angeles Lakers and the LA Forum. And Jeannie is uh, is clearly today the brains behind uh, the Los Angeles Lakers today. Uh, She and her brothers were uh, active, of course, in things like, along with her father, uh, world team tennis, 
uh, the major indoor soccer league with the LA Lasers, all kinds of stuff. So uh, her book is next on my list. That's called Laker Girl. And that too is available on Audible. And again, it's one of the uh, the many thousands of titles that you can choose from uh, when you go to audibletrial.com slash goodseats. And again, you too can get your free audiobook download to give it a try, perhaps one of those two, or perhaps one of the other 180,000 titles uh, available to you as well. Uh, give it a try, audibletrial.com slash goodseats. Thanks for listening and back to our conversation. All right. Well, let's 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 get into this uh, this wacky WFL. It's it's on my brain. Yep. Uh, it's in our our listeners' uh, uh, brains as uh, as our previous episodes, and it's taken us a while to get to it. But uh, boy, oh boy, what a rich and textured uh, <laughs> uh, set of stories uh, for for a league that didn't very that was a mere blip in the in the history of professional football and sports in this country. But let's go back. So. Uh, you're, you're out of the Patriots organization, obviously football very much still in your blood. Uh, I, 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 based on what I've read in your book, uh, it would probably be fair to say that, uh, uh, there wouldn't be a a situation, uh, that, that, uh, wouldn't be interesting to you if just given the chance to do so. Uh, maybe you can give us a little bit of a sense of where you were and where your head was at, uh, before and during the the WFL come coming a call in, so to speak. Well, uh, first and foremost, I I wasn't necessarily looking to go to the WFL, but I knew uh, that in the case of the NFL, which I talk about in in my book, that uh, the again back to the owner and renters, Billy Sullivan, the owner, made sure to let the other owners because he didn't want to look bad. Uh, you know, basically say you know. Bell did nothing but try and take my team away from me and this and that. And, you know, in those days, which would not happen today, uh, if if enough, if two or three owners, uh, I won't call it blacklisting, but if two or three owners say, you know, you better be careful with him, you might not work for a long time, if ever. And I, I was interviewed by three top teams after the Patriots thing, but all of a sudden, uh, the the lines went dead, and I think I know why. So basically, I always thought that I wanted to be an owner, and the only way I was going to be an owner was to go into a, a, a league like many people. I mean, Al Davis was just a coach. He ended up being an owner because he went into a new league and, and eventually, in a power struggle, won out as the older the Oakland Raiders. But I had I had looked at, at Charlotte, North Carolina, years before when I was scouting for the Colts. I, there was another lake. Uh, it, it wasn't called the International Lake, but there was a player I was interested in that played in and like a semi-pro league in Charlotte, and his name was Winston Mapp, and he was a pretty good receiver. And I just went by. I think it was a Continental Lake. That was another lake. And uh, I took a look at him. I, I started to get familiar with Charlotte, and, and I really liked it. And I thought that Charlotte someday might be an NFL franchise city, if not a WFL city. So I went down, met with the mayor, who was one of the richest, most powerful people in the South, John Belk of Belk Department of Stores. I talked to him about, about the situation there, and I was thinking about possibly bringing a team there. And uh, he was okay, but he was a big Redskins fan because, remember, North Carolina and Georgia and those areas, especially when the Redskins first went south with George Marshall, were, was, was a big, big Redskins area. So anyway, I finally convinced him. And uh, then I went to Howard Baldwin, who's now a big Hollywood producer and was the one, by the way, who made the movie Hoosiers. And said, uh, I'm interested because he was partners with Bob Smurts, who owned the Celtics at the time, but also owned the New York Stars, and convinced him to uh, let me take the Stars because Smurts was in real financial trouble and, and transfer them from New York to uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, which is what I did. In fact, I remember the day that uh, uh, I held a press conference with Baldwin to say that they were leaving and how are. Howard Cosell said, listen, young man, Upton Bell, who the hell do you think you are taking a team from the greatest city in America? 
down to that dump in North Carolina. I, was, I still laugh to this day because Cosell was such a put on. But anyway, I took the team to Charlotte, and uh, our opening game was against the Memphis Southland, who a year later would have Zonica kick in Warfield, which started the football wars all over again. And we sold out all four games there within two days out of a out of a hotel there, a motel called the Banger Motel. The ticket office was set up in the lobby of the hotel, and we sold it out. And I, I knew from then on in that I had the right city uh, and a pretty good team, but I also knew that the league was already in a lot of trouble. Well, let, let's but, back up. Let, let's back up for a second because I think it's very important stuff that I, I want to get to because you're, you're really dancing on onto it. Uh, Howard Baldwin, somebody we actually want to get on the show at some point. So uh, keep your fingers crossed because there are a lot of interesting stories there. Or hockey, of course. But yep. Howard Baldwin, right, is the interesting connections that I've learned over time, right, is he's a WHA owner, right, with the New England, I think it was the Whalers, right, who had the Hartford Whalers later on. Yeah. Um, but I think it's important to the story, right, because that's uh, a relationship that uh, became strong with a guy named Gary Davidson, right, who was the instigator of this whole WFL in the first place. A total ripoff artist. Okay, so let's get in. Let's, I mean, let's, don't sugarcoat it, uh, Upton. How about, <laughs> well, g- give us some sense of, of how you and Howard Baldwin and, and the process by which you even considered getting involved in this league kind of got going. I mean, even before you knew the Stars was going to be it, even before you knew Charlotte was going to be the place that the Stars were going to go. Give me some, give us some background as to like how, how you got in, ensnared, shall we say, or entranced by, depending on your perspective, uh, this this league and Davidson in particular? Well, not that, but I'll get to Davidson in a few minutes. But first and foremost, Howard, who lived outside of Boston, he and I were friends, and he came to visit me one day with his attorney, Bob Caparell, who, who uh, did a lot of work for Howard. And uh, said, you know what, I'd like to get you interested in this league. He said, you have a big name. He said, now, at the time, uh, uh, f- first and foremost, he really uh, brought the, the league to Boston first, but he didn't keep it here. They went to New York uh, with Smarts, but it was first here. And it was only here for a while, but then I think he saw that before the season even started, it wasn't going to happen. So. Uh, he moved it to New York with with Smarts, but he said, "Where do we we're really get you involved in this league?" He said, "We're we're trying to get big names into the league, uh, and, and particularly football people that are well known." And he said, uh, well, "I I can have uh, my lawyer Bob Caprell look around at different franchises." And I and he said, "Would you be interested?" I said, "Yeah," but but I said, "I've got a place picked out, whether it's this league or some other league." And I said, "It's North Carolina." I said, so whatever team I would take over, I would want to take it to Charlotte, North Carolina. And the first thing was he looked at, he said, well, l- let me have uh, uh, Gary Davis and some people like take a look around. The first first thing was to take the Detroit wheels there, but the wheels went out of business <laughs> before I could even get to them, and it would be a bad deal. They they were, were no longer in business. So then Baldwin came back to me, and he said, uh, a smarts might want to get rid of it. Actually, Baldwin, as his partner, had a deal uh, with the very famous Broadway producer, David Merrick, to buy the team for $2 million and, and uh, take it off smarts' hands. And they were, they were playing out in Long Island at the time, at, at not a very good place. But Merrick had the money and everything else, and they wanted to sell it, but smarts kept saying, no, I want more money. And because of that, uh, you know, David Merrick said, the hell with you. Uh, I'm not going to do it. So Smirch was stuck with it. And Smirch was getting in deeper, deeper financial trouble uh, with, with, the, uh, with his partners at the Celtics. So he wanted to dump the team. And that's when Baldwin said, how about the Stars? They said, well, I'll take them over. I said, on, on a deal, on an agreement with Smirch, I'm not going to buy them. I'll take them over with an option to buy them if they make it in Charlotte, North Carolina. So Baldwin arranged it. And I remember going to New York and, and meeting with Smirts at his uh, flat in New York. 
having dinner there and Smurts handing me a check for 10000 He said, this will get you going. And we signed an agreement that if uh, I could get the investors together in Charlotte, that I would pay him $2 million. Of course, that, that never happened. But uh, Baldwin had, yes, he had founded the, the, it was originally the Boston Whalers and then the Hartford Whalers. But then after that, uh, he got involved in football too with Davidson. He had me meet with Davidson uh, about six or seven months before I actually got in, involved and took the team to Charlotte. And my first impression is of Davidson is that this is a quick buck artist. This is a guy that is that sells franchise like you and I would sell hamburgers, you know, and that that he wasn't in it because he loved sports or anything else like that. He's a business guy. He he had founded the WHA, and luckily for them, they they survived some really bad times, not because of him, but because some of the people that eventually came, came in the WHA were able to hang on long enough that they finally got somewhat of a merger with the NHL. So, but, but my initial impression of, of uh, Davidson is the same impression I have today, that he quick buck artist in and out. And that's what really, in the end, killed the WFL. There were some very, very there were terrific coaches. There were really good players. There were some rule changes that I really liked. Uh, they, like the old AFL, you know, uh, really appealed to a lot of really good African American players around the country, but Davidson was so quick to go in there and get anybody that would pay some money for a franchise, without looking to these people have any stability, and that was, of course, my worry from the very beginning. But my feeling was that if the Hornets could last long enough in Charlotte, that someday they would go into the NFL. Of course, I was right. It just wasn't me. Yeah, well, that that's especially interesting, right? Because uh, now, uh, let me, I got to ask you this sort of pointed question, right? So sure. uh, given the WFL, right, and be, and, and given your, uh, shall we say, uh, highly qualified uh, 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 understanding, I guess, of, of a non-football guy in Davidson, right? So uh, you, your, your antennae were certainly up, right? And certainly not, not something to ignore. Um, did the heart or does the heart take over at that point? Uh, and say, you know, this is football. This is another shot. I, you know, this is a fledgling league. I, I, I sense Charlotte's an opportunity. I've always said so. Uh, how much? What was going through your head, sort of, to balance the pros and cons? I guess uh, no pun, maybe pun uh, mm -hmm. on, uh, on your a lot of cons of Gary, right, of Gary <laughs> Davidson and, and the and the shakiness of the league. Well, first and foremost, uh, I I remember talking to some of the other owners in the league, and I said, how soon can we get him out? Uh, so I, I, I understood. Part of me uh, said, I want to be an owner. I want to run this team properly. I want to bring something good to Charlotte. Uh, the other part of me said, uh, I don't know if the league can last if Davidson's around too long. And ironically, we, we did get rid of him at the end of the first year. But so much damage had been done uh, even though we came back the second year with Chris Hemeter with a new plan, it was too late. But, you know, that that's from the very beginning, I saw I, very realistic that unless you got him out uh, and could you get him out in time, that with all the good things that I liked about the league, uh, the other part of it is that it wouldn't last. So uh, did you uh, ever get to uh, a Stars game at Downing Stadium on Randall's Island, uh, that sort of dilapidated stadium, before you made the purchase and, and went through that uh, that press conference? Or were you kind of no, getting it? No, I, 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 I did not. I, have no, I had no interest. I, I knew Babe Perilli, who was the coach, who I did replace in the second year, but I knew Babe and I knew a lot of the players. Now, remember, some of the players we have played against and, and lost in, in the uh, biggest upset at that time in NFL history, the Jets. There was there was Jerry Philbin, uh, who played against us in 1968. There was John Elliott, and there were other players uh, that I was familiar with. And for that league, uh, the I, I knew the team was pretty good. I knew Randall's Island was ridiculous, 
And as long as they were there, it didn't make any difference to New York stars. Nobody was going to go see them play. So I had no interest in seeing them play. I had no interest in going to Randall's Island. I knew their roster pretty well. I knew their coaches. In fact, uh, there, there were coaches on their staff. Uh, that one of them, uh, what's his name, Tom, is still is still in the NFL today. It was Peyton Manning's coach? Was was one of one of our coaches? I knew the coaching staff. I knew I knew Babe. I knew the players. So I said to myself, I'm not taking some dog team over. I'm taking a decent team over in this league that can play competitively, and I'm taking it to a city uh, that uh, whatever happens with the league. It's going to be a major league city someday. So they, those were my considerations, all the while knowing the danger, too, of dealing with Smurts because he was very desperate, and he kept calling, you know, all the time. If you got my money yet, if you this or that, and and, and, and also a lot of of uh, the people that he owed up there, cleaning services, everything else like that, they came down and eventually sued us. And and actually, as I have in the book, uh, one game we were playing in Shreveport the first year, and 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 if you remember the old the sheriff of the Dodge commercial, uh, that that sheriff of Louisiana came in and uh, was going to arrest everybody unless we gave them the equipment uh, that was uh, our equipment that was was under uh, some type of lien to a cleaning uh, agency in New York City. So, so we end up playing the game, and then afterwards the sheriff took over all the uniforms, and we, and our team flew back to Charlotte without any uniforms. We finally got them out for the next game, but that's what the league was like. Well, let me. I gotta say, okay, this is an interesting point of order here. So uh, it seems to me that that uh, the um, uh, the uh, the I guess the reclaiming of uniforms was a common thing in this league, right? This is not the first story I've heard. Where uniforms were taken as either collateral or or whatever. What what is it with the uniforms? Like who's who's thinking that these things are actually valuable enough? Uh, to... They're not, but you can't play the game without them. So you know that in many franchises, Birmingham, who ended up playing in the championship uh, game uh, the first year before they closed the league down the first year, and played against Florida, uh, who was owned at the time by Robbie Loud, who worked for me here. Uh, that that uh, they owed back taxes to the IRS and everything else like that. They played the championship game, and they were they were going to confiscate the uniforms for that. Because again, what's the easiest thing to grab? If the owner has no money, and the players are hardly making anything, what what do you grab? You grab the uniforms because you know the team can't play without them. <laughs> All right. Well, some more comicalness, at least for, uh, from from my perspective, right? Okay. So I guess I'm I'm, sure. really, I'm really curious, right? So how do you how do you affect a a shift and a move of a franchise literally in the middle of the season and literally I don't know a number of days before your next game, which is which is an away game? How does that even? I mean, I know Houston moved to Shreveport. You guys moved down to Charlotte, obviously, with a stop in Chicago first for your first game as Charlotte. I want to talk about that in a second. Um, two two franchises that already folded sort of outright. Um, was there any reservation in your mind in this process, given all those things? And and did you ever did you have any presence of mind to sort of say, "Holy cow, I'm moving a franchise in the middle of the season." <laughs> nah, it didn't work? No, no. Well, a couple of things. Remember. Now I'm going back to past experiences back in the 30s and 40s, and and so I was I was kind of used to as a kid moving from place to place, and and kind of absorbing the idea that you know the the great NFL that we know today uh, don't think they didn't go through things like that and probably worse. So to me. Uh, the bottom line is is looking through it. Did I have the right city? Yes. Did I have what I thought was a representative right team? Yes. So I did, did a lot of work before I took them over. I had gone to Charlotte two or three times, met with the mayor. I set up a deal with the city stadium there. I set up a place for our operation at the Bangor Hotel. 
I went uh, out to Belmont Abbey and set up a training site that could be taken in overnight. Uh, I had I had practically everything planned. So when the time came, we play, they played, I think it was on a Thursday night, Friday, Babe Proley and I were on a plane down there to hold a press conference. Saturday, the uh, team uh, came in, Saturday or Sunday, and uh, immediately bussed out to uh, Belmont Abbey. We got them dorm rooms for the players out there. Uh, you, you know, a lot of people in Charlotte were absolutely fabulous. To this day, I say some of the best people I ever dealt with. So I, I knew how to do all of that work ahead of time. So it wasn't any big deal to me. That's interesting. Um, do you want to talk about uh, the little in- incident or the, the specific uh, uh, mechanics of getting the team ready for their first ever game as Charlotte, and I guess still named, I guess, the Stars, but playing uh, away in Chicago? Seems a little interesting stories there. Well, we have act- actually we played. Um, we we had to play on the road before we came home against uh, you know the Memphis Southmen, and uh, I think it was a Thursday. I think we played on Thursdays then because they did have a TV contract for a while uh, with Eddie Heinhorn's network, TBS, right. the TBS uh, uh, Television Network, and we have a, a really yeah. great episode with uh, the uh, director and producer of those telecasts, Howard Zuckerman. Uh, a, yep. great, a great episode. I, I highly encourage our audience. And if you haven't <laughs> yourself to listen, to it, it's just it's a wild story, including things like uh, parking the truck in the middle of the country, waiting to hear where they were going to go because there were so many franchise moves. I mean, yeah, crazy. well, that that no, that that's absolutely right. And actually, that 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 uh, they did pretty well in the ratings in the beginning. But, yeah, there's there's a lot of stories with that. But but we did open up or not open up but as as a new team. In fact, the the our equipment manager had to go. I think he went to the Bears. Yes, that's what and I'm, got yes. and got the uh, Bears or the the equipment manager at the Bears to help them uh, uh, get new jerseys that will reflect Charlotte instead of the New York Stars. So we did open up in Chicago. In fact, I think remember that there were a lot of old NFL stars hanging around. I think Butkus was there that night. Um, with the Chicago team, and of course they they eventually went out of business. But but they uh, that 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 wasn't the players kind of accepted the whole idea because I said to them after the game I said we're going to Charlotte. You're going to find the weather nicer. You're going to find a situation where people really want you. And uh, once they they kind of absorbed that. You know, we got on a, on a plane, went to Charlotte, and got ready to play against a sold-out house against the Memphis Southmen. And actually, I got, by that time, I got Arlo Palmer to invest in the team. He gave me a gold Cadillac to ride around the town in, and he came to the opening game. We had a big party afterwards, and Palmer came in. But, you know, Palmer had the largest Cadillac agency in North Carolina at that time in Charlotte. And so there were a lot of people that were were really good, and and it was it was a tremendous experience for the city and for everybody else. Even though I knew storm clouds were out there with different franchises that were in financial trouble. Well, it was clearly a validation of that that the Charlotte and uh, all the homework that you had done previously was uh, was absolutely ripe and ready for professional football. For our completists out there, though, before we get into a little bit of that, I. Um, I, I'm really, I really want to sort of nail this down. So you were in your first week playing against Chicago. You were known as the Charlotte Stars at that point. It was the Charlotte Stars, and I had run a promotion with the Charlotte Observer and the Charlotte News to name the team. So uh, we ran the promotion. I think it ran for about a week or so, and uh, they they left it up to me. And I said, "Who got the most votes?" And and it was the Charlotte Hornets because there was a Hornets baseball team there years before, and so they the the papers, the fans picked the name, so it was the Charlotte Hornets. That's how we got the name. And was it the Charlotte Hornets by the time you had your first home game against Memphis, or was it still the Stars before the, then you? Ultimately- I believe it was the Charlotte. No, it was the Charlotte Hornets by that by that okay. time because so, I wanted it ready for the opening game. Got it. So technically, you were the Charlotte Stars for one game d- during this season. 
Yep, that was it. Very interesting. And and I, I thought I heard a story. You mentioned the equipment manager. I think your equipment manager, I think just just out of sheer desperation, uh, called the Bears and got some some stickers of the letter C and put them yep. on top of the stars for the for your. <laughs> yep, that's right. They that's that's what he did. And uh, you know, again, the, the the thing that that I would like to point out to people, you know, things seem so easy when you look at the NFL today. Somebody buys a team uh, for a, a near a billion dollars or more, and they're in the in the club. Uh, but most of the other leagues that were founded in any sport went through these different things, and you had to be able to, to deal with it. But uh, you know, again. Now it's 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 so easy, but when you look back at at the start of all of these leagues, including baseball, this is the way it was. And if you were lucky enough, you survived it. <clears throat> if you didn't, you know, if you didn't, if you did a television contract to the owners, a lot of owners went broke in a lot of leagues. So for me, I wasn't as panicked as maybe other people were. Yeah, and and you know what? So it's very interesting. You, you mentioned in in the book, and and I highly, obviously, encourage it. the book is rich of stories, but these in in particular on this the WFL stuff. You mentioned in the '74 season that you even went out of your way to ensure that the Florida Blazers, one of many franchises who were just literally going sideways financially, that you literally stuck up and paid you know the salary <laughs> for the team for one week to play to ensure that they were going to play. But I thought it was interesting. In your, as you referred back to why you did it, um, it actually goes back to that circle, right? Of what you remembered of of your dad's doing and and the the, the original owners of the league back in the NFL days, early NFL days. You know, that's kind of what you kind of had to do to kind of keep this thing going. And you helped out other other members of the club, so to speak, to to well, to go keep going. Well, t- two things here. Well, one one, let me go back first, and then I'll explain the rest of the story because you know the book is 300 and some pages and, and uh that the, there was more to that blazer story which i'll tell you in just a minute but going back i can remember i think it was 1937 or 38 my father had no advance in those days what the owners did in the nfl is if you didn't have any advance gate at, at all you would call the game and you would say a uh, game called because of rain, even if it was 70 degrees out and sunny. Uh, you know, it was a, were many times when owners canceled games because they had no gate. So in this case, my father called the, t- the team in the NFL at that time was actually uh, owned. Uh, they uh, it was called the Brooklyn Dodgers, like the baseball team, but it was an NFL team and they were due to come in and play the Eagles. But uh, my father was playing at, uh, wasn't at Chai Park, it was at Municipal Stadium, which then, of course, eventually was where the Army-Navy game was played. There was almost 100,000 seats there. And my father called the owner and said, you know what, I don't have a ticket sold. He said, I'd like to call the game or put it off for a week. And the, the owner said to him, you're not calling that game off. He said, I'm dating Sonia Henney now, the, the Olympic star. A skater. He said, I'm dating her now. And I told her, I promised her a game in Philadelphia. So you better play that goddamn game. <laughs> My father said, there are, no, there are no tickets sold. And he said, I don't care. I promised her that game. I'm coming down and you better play the game. So he ended up playing the game. There was not, I don't think there was one person in the stadium. There were a hundred people in the press box eating his hot dogs. And it's all because Sonia Henney wanted to see a game. And, and that's that's the way it was. So you go from that and you go to where I was in, in 1974 and 75, and I'd say, geez, this is an improvement. So now we go to the Florida situation. Florida had a terrific team. They, they had Bob Davis, who was the All-American quarterback at, at Virginia. They had Tommy Raymond, who was the best running back in the league. They had a terrific team. They're owned by Romney Loud, who didn't have a nickel, and, and later died prematurely and was into drugs and everything else like that. So I get a call about, I think it was two days before the game, and it's the judge, and he's in court there. And he called, and he said, uh, he said I am going to stop 
this team from flying or going anywhere because the only thing they can afford is toilet paper. Uh, I've got him on the on the speaker system in my lawyer's office, and he said uh, they, they don't have enough money to come up. And he said I'm legally not going to. Uh, I'm going to hold Rami loud in contempt. He said so you have. Only one choice. If you're willing to pay their way up and pay their, ready for this, pay their game check, I'll let them go. If not, they stay here. Now, I had the game sold out. So what the hell am I going to do? Am I going, am I going to uh, now say to uh, the press in Charlotte and the people who bought the tickets, no game because the team can't afford their way to, uh, to pay their way up? So I said to the judge, I said, I will uh, get the airline, and I will pay for the charter flight up, and I'll pay uh, a game check. <laughs> that's, I, it might be the only time in history, and that's what we did. And actually, they upset us that night. And I remember going down on the field after the game and talking to Davis, and Davis said, uh, thanks for everything, and he said, thanks for the game check. I said, Thanks for everything. You just beat us. And that that's the story. That's how they got up. Well, and that was repaint in kind, right, with a, a, another kick <laughs> in the butt, so to speak, uh, when it came to playoff time. You want to sort of regale our audience in sort of that shenanigan, too? Well, actually, we, we were due because we had a pretty good team. We were due to start the playoffs. And uh, the week before, of course, a week or two weeks before they'd taken the uniforms, I got them back. But basically, uh, what... John Bassett, who was really the commissioner of the league, uh, uh, Davison, they got out that year. And and uh, John Bassett, uh, basically, he was the most powerful owner, basically said, you know, we've got to figure this thing out. Um, and so we'll put in if teams can't afford to pay their way into the, uh, the, the different sites around, uh, we would prefer for them to stay out and uh, you're one of the teams that we would prefer to stay out for the time being. And ordinarily, I would, I would fight them on that, but basically because of the financial situation, I said, that's fine. I don't, I, I, at this time, you know, there were no tickets sold in Charlotte, and we were going to have to play on the road. I said, you know, if that's the way it is and you can explain it, go ahead and explain it because I'm not going to explain it. So that's how we and some other pretty good teams ended up not in the playoffs that year. As it turned out, I'm just as glad because we probably would have played someplace on the road where there'd be nobody in the stands. You know, it's like Burt Bell back in 1937. Yeah, I mean, that's just to give you a whole state. Well, all right. So, I mean, it seems a little uh, odd and sad, right? I mean, you qualify for the playoffs. Ostensibly, you play to get into the playoffs and – and ostensibly to potentially be in a position to win a championship. But then, you know, the, the, the uh, while financial realities take precedence, of course, uh, it, it seems kind of seems almost kind of uh, uh, almost fruitless if that's uh, if that's what's going to happen near sort of the end of it. But all right, I guess that's sort of a, just a huge indication if there weren't many others. Right. That the postmortem on this season, I mean, obviously limping along. You you made a reference to the uh, the World Bowl being basically the broke bowl. Right. Uh, the, you know, there's no doubt that this league is just it's just falling apart at the seams. Um, give it give, give us give our audience some sense that uh, you were still very much obviously committed to Charlotte as a market. You would obviously experience a whole bunch of success there. Uh, much of your inklings were correct. Um, how, though, do you square that with uh, what is just basically a just a. Uh, a, a complete shambles of of, of a postseason, uh, and well, and you mentioned Heminer is sort of stepping up. Um, how, do you, well, that that's what do you think that's about doing what, another year of this. But that, but that's what I what I saw was the best thing that could happen is if there was a self destruct and a new league came out of it, and we had decided way before then to have a, a crucial meeting in Memphis as soon as the season's over and re-establish the league with new owners and with Chris Hemeter with a plan they called the Hemeter plan uh, that would now, you could sign players, but you had, if you were going to pay a lot of money, you had to show that you had the money in the bank to be able to sign them, that you just weren't going to go out and sign them 
Uh, now, uh, uh, Zonka, Kick, and Warfield were coming in that year, and we'd signed a lot of NFL players. But uh, unless your team can afford them, now John Bassett, the Carling, you know, the, the Carling Brewery, John Bassett had millions of dollars, and that's how he was able to sign Zonka, Kick, and Warfield. And in some ways, uh, ironically, uh, because Don Chul and I were friends for years, that stopped Miami's great run. If you remember, Miami won in 72 and 73, and then 74, you know, they, they had lost to Oakland, but they, they were still a power, and they might have been the power instead of the Steelers, but remember, they lost Zonka, Kick, and Warfield to John Bassett. So the whole idea was a new league, financial responsibility, get rid of the old owners, Davidson's gone, and and that really appealed to me. And Heminger was a really smart guy, a very brilliant guy. In fact, he was so impressive that Joe Marshall, who was the assistant at Sports Illustrated, who was covering uh, this trip around the league in the off season, decided to leave Sports Illustrated and become the assistant commissioner of the league. Uh, he was impressed with what it looked like that it was now a new responsible league and uh, still had many new players coming into it and a lot of things going for it. So that's my reason. I, I was kind of happy in some ways that they, that they shut us down and other teams because we're going to go anywhere unless, as I talk to the other owners in the league, unless we reestablish a league with different people. And uh, the, the big question then was, which eventually – took the league down and, and into the second season is that they had lost so much credibility. They, we had gotten some fairly decent owners uh, that had money. But what happened was, like everything else, is what the NFL will eventually face with concussions and some of the other things they're doing. Once you lose credibility with the public, even if you're well-established for the next year, it's too late. Do you think that... Um that Joe Namath uh, rebuffing the uh, entreaties by the Chicago now wins. Um, do you think he, if he were to have signed and I, there was obviously rationale, I guess, for his, his agent and, and stuff to, to ultimately not sign. Um, do you think if, if Namath had signed that that might've changed the trajectory? Uh, ab- the- absolutely. Really? Absolutely. It's interesting. And again, again, in my book, president of the creation, uh, I, I knew I knew about that. There were only a couple of, uh, of us owners that knew the deal. And, and what we had decided was, again, how do we get a TV contract for the second year? Because the NFL was worried. In fact, it's funny. But remember that the NFL uh, in 74, uh, either 74 or early 75, they actually – the NBC called me and said, you know, the NFL looks like they're going to be on strike. If they do, we'd like to do one of your games. And in the meantime, I'm backtracking a little bit. I had made a deal with Ted Turner to do my uh, uh, games. I, I got a TV contract with TVS, which he owned in Charlotte. And Turner and I met, really fascinating, which I talk about in the epilogue in the book. Uh, t- uh, Ted Turner and I meet, and Turner said, you know what? I'm going to make you big boy through not only in Charlotte, but all throughout the South. My whole TV network will carry all your games. We had made a deal. Uh, we had gotten new ownership uh, in there. And the key was television. So we had a meeting uh, with Hemeter, and the whole idea was this. We talked to Joe's agent. And, and here's another thing I think I put in the book, that uh, we all agreed that we signed Namath, we were told we would get with TVS, and we had another, another group interested, guaranteed contract uh, for full WFL games. And Namath, of course, would be the focal point. He'd go to Chicago, which we wanted in a big, big city. We are going to bring it to you. Or if he really wanted it, we would, we would uh, have him put together a group and, and bring it back to New York. And uh, what, what happened was the stupidity of it is that the owners, when it went to a vote of the owners, uh, the whole idea was it, that TVS and another network said, look, uh, you're not going to get much money out of it 
uh, your first couple of years. Uh, we want a huge, we want a huge thing here. But the biggest thing was the name of, and his attorney, and his attorney basically is still his attorney today, I believe, said we want a bigger piece for Joe than this. You know, let, let's say we we want instead of fifty percent, we want seventy five percent. And stupidly, and I remember saying to the owners, "Listen, <laughs> give him whatever he wants, because if 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 you don't give him whatever he wants, you have no league. You have no league without a TV contract." But they were so small-minded and stupid that basically they said, "No, we don't want to give up that much. We want more money for ourselves." Does that sound familiar even today? Sure. So what happened was. The deal with with uh, with Namath and his attorney fell through, and in fact, we had even gotten to the point. I had proposed. I said, uh, "What what where we are today? You know, Tom Brady is always bitchy and moaning about, you know, don't go near my knees and, and the NFL now for quarterbacks hardly get touched anymore." Uh, but we had worked out a deal, and I said, "Look, Namath has you know really fragile knees." Let's just make sure, make it look good, whether it's wrestling or not, but nobody hits Namath knees. So we had agreed that if this whole deal went through, that you still rush the passer, but instead of premium, you you know, you, you just let the, the offensive lineman ride them by the quarterback. So there it was. There was the chance for the league uh, you know, the NFL, remember, it was the 70s. The NFL was strong, but it still wasn't the behemoth it is today. And so if you get a TV contract, you get Namath. We've got Sonica Kick and Warfield coming into the league. We have other people coming in. We have fairly good stability. And because uh, two or three owners said, the hell with them, we're, we're not going to give them that much money, there was the chance, and it was gone. And you're all this time still trying to raise dough for the Charlotte franchise to ostensibly pay back uh, uh, Schmertz as well as, you know, uh, have the, the, the outright ownership of, of the franchise, right? Well, yeah, it, it, but the biggest thing, and it's a fascinating story, biggest thing is the North Carolina National Bank led by Luther Hodges, uh, whose father was the uh, agriculture uh, secretary under JFK, and Luther was one of the uh, most brilliant young bankers in America, and his assistant was Hugh McCall, who eventually took over the Bank of America and just retired a couple of years ago. They were behind the team. They they were going to help us. In fact, they gave us uh, free offices in, in their beautiful building in the NCNB in, in Charlotte. And what has happened is we had actually a public offering the second year around. And, of course, I talk about it in the book. It's another bizarre but really interesting thing. Guy flies up from Memphis by the name of, of uh, Paul Sasso. Paul Sasso. And he said, uh, flies in his private jet, comes over, and he said, uh, I've got, he said, I've read about your plight. And he said, I'm willing to put a couple of million into the team. He said, you know, I want equal ownership with you, Upton. And he said, uh, I've got uh, a model of a stadium. Uh, I, w- I want to go over and meet with the mayor and show him. We took him over to the mayor, and Belk seemed to like it. Uh, underground parking, all these other things. Dome Stadium because of the heat in Charlotte in the summertime. To make a long story short, three days later, he is essentially, I would say, kidnapped the uh, Larry Charlton, who at the time was the uh, sports editor of the Charlotte Observer, takes him out just uh, where Sassone is, and uh, Sassone tells him all these stories about what he's going to do for Charlotte and everything else like that. Then a day later, Bill Ballinger, I think Bill's still alive, who wrote for the Charlotte News, uh, comes back and, and writes a story about going on a plane with this Paul Sassone, uh, who uh, was brandishing guns uh, with his pilot, and flying up to to uh, Toronto to try and talk to John Bassett, and uh, just a kind of a bizarre thing. He comes back to the Charlotte airport, and when he gets off, he's arrested uh, by the police, by marshals. And uh, again, make a long story short, 
it's uh, he's a fugitive that stole a plane in Memphis. He was in the witness protection program, comes comes to Charlotte and masks himself as somebody that's going to save the team. Of course, he said that he would have the $2 million, I think, by Monday. And, of course, that $2 million never went in. Again, so they go back and they find out his story. He's back in, in uh, Memphis in jail. And as it turns out, he was, he was put in the witness protection program because his real name was Paul Sasson from New York. He, he uh, tried to commit suicide off the Veronzano Bridge, and they talked him down off, off the bridge and uh, put him in the witness protection program. And uh, there he was in Charlotte. Somehow he stole a plane and came to, or, or in Memphis and came to Charlotte and fooled everybody for three days. How do you like that for a story? Uh, you know, this is the league that keeps on giving, right? The, these stories, I mean, I, you, you, I, you could not write these and, and be taken seriously, and yet these were actually things that happened. Read my book. <laughs> no, I, I, and, and I encourage our audience to do that because it's just, I mean, your experiences are, are but a microcosm of, of, of this, this crazy league. All right, so um, how does it end? Uh, and, and I think it's actually... Uh, uh, quite uh, uh, touching and or ironic and or uh, pick your adjective uh, about how the uh, how the team and then a couple of days later, the actual league itself sort of whimpers to an end. Uh, maybe you want to set the scene as to uh, the place where your final game actually winds up happening. Well, you know, it's, that's ironic. We, I think in life we keep returning to things without realizing them. Uh, I I think of, of Franklin Field, and it was the place that my father got the Eagles into when they could have gone under. This was when he was commissioner. It's the place where he died. It's the place where we, on a on a rainy, hot night in Philadelphia, uh, where we played our final game against the Philadelphia Bell. I had invited my mother to go to to the game. And she had not been there, I think, in 30 or 40 years. And uh, nobody showed up to the games. That sounds familiar. Played in a, in a rainstorm uh, with actually the place being rung uh, by the unions that uh, had something going against the University of Pennsylvania. So the game ends and uh, we go back to Charlotte and... Two days later, they uh, actually Howard Cosell broke the story that the owners, I was one of the few that uh, voted not to close, but the other owners in the league decided they didn't want to spend any more money, and so the league closed down. And uh, that, that was it, that uh, the, the, the whole situation closed down, and uh, Maybe, maybe again, there were so many maybes, maybe it, it would have worked. But actually, a month later, my mother climbed the stairs because there are no elevators, still aren't at Franklin Field. And uh, she got sick when she came home. She was dead a month later. Died on Thanksgiving Day. So the team died. She died. My father died there. And uh, that's the way it ended. And ironically, the next day, after we announced the end of the league, I called Dan Rooney at the Steelers, and I said, Dan, I just want to tell you that uh, you're the head of the expansion franchise. This city deserves a franchise. I said, they're, they're, going, to, they're going to be a great city. And he said, uh, you know what? Thank you. He said, I'll let the committee know what you have to say, blah, 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 blah. And, of course, they eventually came in. Uh, Barry Richardson, I, back to the ironies of life. First year I go to the Colts, 1960, and Jerry Richardson has decided after they won the championship in 59 to take his bonus money and retire. He was Raymond Berry's backup, went to North Carolina, South Carolina, founded the Hardy's Hamburger Place, and he's the guy that got the franchise instead of me. Well, apparently it's available again, so maybe now's your last chance. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I say at the end of that chapter, uh, the, the, I, I quote the famous end of, of Hemingway's The Old Man in the Sea, and basically talking about the old man after 
he and and kind of a uh, a look at my life in in Charlotte in football. I wasn't able to get the Eagles back. Tried to buy them back uh, in the middle of the sixties. Then drive with Charlotte, and and of course, the the great story is that the old man went out, caught caught the biggest fish of his life, tied it to the side of his ship. This was the greatest victory of his life, and on the way way back, the sharks kept eating away, and by the time he got to port, there was nothing left but the bones of the fish. And he went back and that night and had his cup of coffee and went to bed and dreamed of someday having to catch that fish again. And I basically said, uh, my fishing is over. I can't do this anymore. I'm not going to be able to go out and get another fish or a franchise. I have to realize that Charlotte's the end of my life in football. And it was. But it did it did open up the door though to a um, uh, a quite successful and and still going uh, broadcast career and um, yeah uh, you yeah know, no a, a very interesting sort of renaissance for you no no it, it 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 was because the thing now and the thing I've been able to do well two things I stayed in sports till about full time uh, in radio and television until about fifteen years ago and decided that I wanted to go the other way. And, and do straight talk and, and talk to authors and famous people all over the world. And that's been another renaissance. But the thing I've been able to do is when you're on, in the inside of football, as all of these ex-GMs and players, when they go to ESPN and all these places, they find out that the things that they knew when they played and coached are completely different when you get outside of it and look at it. So I was even able better to judge. I can judge a player. I've always been able to, but I could judge a player better today by being away from it and looking at it in a different way than I could then. So there, there's always, if you're willing to look something else there, but still, again, it's, it's been an incredible ride. I've I've done practically everything I want to do in my life and, and understanding if you live long enough, they're going to be a hell of a lot of disappointments, too. All right, I got two final questions for you. One, one small, short one, and one uh, sort of uh, 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 landscape uh, looking forward. Uh, the short one is this: uh, a part of your uh, broadcasting career uh, included uh, a year uh, as the color commentator for the uh, uh, the USFL Boston Breakers, the first mm-hmm. year of that team, which parapathetically then went to New Orleans and then went to Portland, and that's a whole story in and of itself. someday we'll get into that. Um, uh, having been part of the USFL, at least in that uh, in that regard, um, why do you think the USFL didn't look at Charlotte based on your experiences and or recommendation to the NFL folks of that as a market? You, any- I, I, you know what? And it, it's funny because one of the owners was Randy Vataha, who I signed as a free agent my first year with the Patriots. And he was with a group. Uh, George Matthews was the principal owner. Uh, who's a multimillionaire from around here at Northeastern? But I, you know what I had said to them, I don't, I don't know why you're going to New Orleans. You should go to Charlotte. Uh, but I'm trying to think. Had, no, they had not. Charlotte had not come in yet. Uh, but you know, ne- never underestimate sometimes the stupidity of people when something's right in front of them. Because I, I think again, l- luckily in uh, for the NFL they didn't go in there that they went went someplace else you know but again if you have to get if if i thought the usfl really had a real chance to make it they had some i mean think of jim kelly think of all the good players that came out of that lake oh yeah but but again if you don't have really strong ownership i mean it's easy to get uh, the NFL today because of all the money you get. But you, in any league you start, if you want to make it, you have to get people like the people that Lamar Hunt got, the people like Burt Bell and Art Rooney and George Hallis that, that had a dream and were willing to back it up with their money. What happens to these Johnny come latelys in a lot of these leagues, they get in, they think it's really great, and then they start losing money and and they're not willing to hang on. Hunt and the, his owners were willing to hang on. Burt Bell and, and, and their owners were willing to hang on. Uh, that's why they made it. And that's 
probably too late for any league to make it now because the NFL are 32 teams. And 16 of them, to me, are like expansion teams. My God, the, 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 the quality of football, uh, luckily for the TV, and, the, and there are enough great players on at least 16 teams. But there are teams today that I would say are, are playing in the NFL are not as good as the USFL. Absolutely. And probably not as good as, as some of the teams in the old AFL. They're just, you can't be. You've got 32 teams. There's, there's not enough players. They're not, there might be eight or 10 really good quarterbacks, and there might be another 16 or so that are not good at all. Well, that's my last question is sort of uh, what do you think the future of the NFL uh, is and looks like? I mean, it, it, you, know, you mentioned the term storm clouds uh, earlier. I, you know, you can't not be a fan of, of, of pro football uh, and not sort of see some of the uh, cracks, I guess, perhaps in the shield that is the NFL, uh, whether it's CTE or, uh, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the treatment of players and their 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 grievances. Uh, frankly, just the, the how uh, communities are, are you know, uh, in many respects, being held hostage by teams, uh, you know, and their their demands for upgrading stadiums and, and all those kinds of things. It seems to me that uh, there is, you know, there are a bunch of things that could easily trip up uh, a very successful, arguably the most successful sports league uh, in this country, if not uh, careful and or uh, wise. What, what what what's what's the famous line from the movie Wall Street? Greed is good. Greed is good. And I, I think what's happened here, first of all, do you know any dynasty, any great business that doesn't eventually come back to earth? I mean, it, it's, it has to happen. It might take longer, but it's, it's the thinking uh, and the way you act that brings it back to earth. So I look at, I look at CTE is certainly one of them. But I think the, the greatest danger to the league is that the overexposure, because you, you can't, you, you're, you're educating people, but you can't educate people to the point of them saying, wait a minute, I'm not that dumb, that product stinks. You know, when you're, when you're trying to show every team, now you have the red zone. I turn the red zone on on Sunday, and a lot of times I say, I, I might I'll watch the Patriots game, but I don't need to watch all these other games. I can get the best plays on red zone. So you're taking and telling people the 32 teams are quality products? Come on. I mean, if, if, if you're on Sunday afternoon, Sunday night, Monday night, Thursday night, and then when you get into December, Saturday, you mean to tell me that, that, that the public is not going to see that this product isn't that good, parts of it? I think that's the greatest danger uh, to the league itself. And, and they're not going back because they keep saying the money is really good. But the other thing is that, that there's such inequality. The Players Association, it's the only league as strong as it is where the Players Association really basically has no power. Baseball has it. Hockey now has it. Basketball certainly has it. The NFL player is, is still grossly underpaid uh, for what he does. His life is very short, three to three and a half years. And, and yet uh, much of the time their player association just doesn't have the power and never really has. So there's, there's a lot of, of inequality there. Now, w whether it'll take 10, 15, 20 years, I, I have no idea. But I think the other thing that you have to look at is this generation, people 20 to 40 years old, let's say, they're on their phones, they're on their computers, uh, they're, they're not really fans of the game. They, they play fantasy football, but they're not doing it because they think so-and-so is better than so-and-so. It, it'll eventually, by the way, be gambling. It is gambling. So there, are you creating fans or are you creating people that are just keeping score? Uh, all of that. And, and I, the NFL is smart in that they're selling rights now to 
being able to watch a game on your computer and get it on your phone and everything else like that. But I think the days of people sitting down and watching a doubleheader uh, in the millions, I think those days are over. Yeah, I hope not. Yeah, I, I, I hope. Yeah, but my, I think it is. Yeah, and my professional day job is in the the media industry, and um, and clearly, you look at television viewing. Uh, you mentioned uh, millennials. Uh, there are, you know, the, the the viewing habits are just are saturation. All those things, and and the way people watch television, right? The, the c- cutting cable cords and uh, the streaming, and 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 not necessarily being exposed to advertising. I mean, look, the one thing though the NFL has going for it, but for how long is a question? Is uh, its uh, dominance as a live and uh, hard to uh, record or skip or not see live a product. And uh, it's very interesting to see how intertwined uh, network television and the NFL are these days. And all the cracks in the television part are already starting to happen. Uh, and if the NFL is not careful, uh, it, it in some respects could wind up being a, uh, a very, uh, uh, I don't know, mutually uh, uh, unbeneficial uh, relationship. Uh, they might go down together. Um, clearly, if you're not pay- if you're not paying attention, to the, some of those uh, some of those pieces are starting to crack, and it'll be interesting to sort of see how it plays out. Well, well, let, let let me pose this to you and your audience: uh, the the craziness of it. Peyton Manning ten ten million dollars by Fox or ESPN. Do you think that Peyton Manning or Jesus Christ Himself could draw one more viewer if the game's no good? It's a joke. It, it, it is absolutely, hey, good for Manny if he can do it. Uh, but, but what I'm saying is uh, you can talk about every new star on, whether it was John Madden to start out that kind of changed the color commentator's role all the way through. But you tell me if you've got uh, two stiff teams playing each other uh, that that. Peyton Manning or Tom Brady or anybody else that you put out there is going to make a difference. And yet that that's the craziness of just what you're talking about. That, that television, you know, you talk to people on television, they think there's never going to be the end of anything. And, and I understand how they feel in football. And I, I certainly, I, I like the game. I, there, there's a lot of fault that I find with it. But uh, the other thing that, that I really find, whether you're on your computer, your cell phone, or, or you're just watching TV, the games are entirely too long. And the breaks for commercials, and they're trying every, And please, God, take me back to the time when there was no replay. Please take me back to the time when a catch was a catch. Th- this has gotten ridiculous. Even... It, Ninety percent of the time, uh, most of the calls are right, but that's true in any sport. Do we have to take it to the point of where we go through this agony on every play, every touchdowns repeated? What you you say to yourself? I'm not going to sit here for this. I think that's another element. Yeah, that's very interesting and 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 well said. Right, and coming from somebody like yourself, who's literally and figuratively lived a life in football. Um, those are uh, important thoughts, and and I, I you wonder how the how the sport of professional football looks going forward. Uh, I'm sure you will be paying keen attention in the years to come. And um, I can't thank you enough. This has been a uh, this has been fun. This has been a great conversation, and I, I look forward to uh, sharing this with our uh, with our, our growing and very passionate audience. Um, one last uh, opportunity here. Why don't you uh, do a little song and dance here for the book? Uh, describe where uh, where we can get it and, uh, the, and and all that kind of good stuff. Well, first and for, foremost, uh, I think it's the most definitive uh, book on the history of pro football, but also the country. It's called Present at the Creation of My Life in the NFL and How It Became a Behemoth. But basically, it's also a story. It's a personal story of somebody that's seen every era from the 30s to today and and can really take the reader through what it really is, including many of the people in it uh, that weren't even around football. As my mother, my mother had a, an incredible career, but added to the NFL. All of the characters that go through this book, 
you'll never hear of again. And so, therefore, I, I, you can get it on the cheapest way to do it. That's in bookstores all over the country. And you can get it on audio now, too. But the cheapest way, the best way, is just go on Amazon. There are great reviews on it on Amazon. And uh, you can get it uh, at, at a really reasonable price. But I guarantee you this, you'll take a trip like you've never taken through the game if you read this book. Oh, I can vouch for that. I've, I've read uh, significant portions of it already. It's uh, published by University of Nebraska Press, who we thank uh, tremendously for... Um, uh, connecting us to Upton, it's been a great conversation. Uh, Rosemary Sakura, in particular, the publicity manager there, thank you. Uh, and uh, I look forward to uh, hopefully staying in touch. And um, I'll let you know when we uh, get this ep episode up and running, hopefully in the next uh, two or three weeks. Uh, and um, I can't thank you enough. This has been absolutely tremendous. I, I appreciate the time. And I know our audience uh, will and does, too. Just remember, on any given Sunday, that's what Bert Bell said. Anybody can beat anybody else. <laughs>
uh, all the books and stuff you hear about uh, through our website at goodseedsstillavailable.com. Socially, we like to be social, uh, and apparently more and more of you do too. So find us at on Twitter at uh, Good Seats Still. Uh, you'll find us on uh, Instagram at Good Seats Still Available. And uh, yes, there is a Facebook page devoted to us as well. Uh, you can find us there and uh, send us notes or whatever you'd like there as well. Uh, last but not least, our friends at Podfly Productions who put this show together, in particular, the great Jerry Payne, the good doctor. Uh, and uh, if you want to learn about uh, podcasting and a little bit uh, about what their services are, how to how they help you get going if, uh, out of nowhere, uh, or frankly, if you're a pro and you just want some expert uh, editing and production uh, help, Podfly Productions is the place to go. Tell them I sent you. Uh, and of course, you can find them at podfly.net. Okay, we're done for this week. Thanks so much for listening. We will see you next week. No, we won't. We'll hear you. We'll talk to you. You will listen to us, hopefully, next week. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, we look forward to it. And uh, thank you again, as always, for listening. Till then, take care, everybody. <laughs>